Is uh, a lot, particularly Japan, but in general, China capital export to the world, and Hong Kong is a very important part of it. And I'm going to talk about why Hong Kong is that important, and, and the, what is the, the political and, and social consequence of it. Um, and uh, some of you have been here that heard the story, but I uh, like to keep talking about this story because actually I'm uh, thinking about uh, turning uh, this interesting uh, instance into. Um, and saw an article, and there's some uh, interesting insight that we can gain from it. It, it is uh, my last book, the, the most recent book, The China Boom, Why China Rule the World, uh, published in 2015. Uh, it's ready, as I think, that uh, predicted the economic slowdown of China and so and so. And uh, so it is the Chinese state capitalism in Hong Kong, so it is the state capitalism of, uh, uh, part of it. So I talk about the political economy of the origins of Chinese uh, economic. Uh, prosperity in recent times and also uh, the origins of its uh, recent uh, slowdown and economic crisis. And the funny thing is that uh, I didn't know that uh, the, 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 the city press, uh, Chongxin, that is uh, kind of a state owned uh, uh, publishing house of a state owned conglomerate, uh, uh, CITIC, uh, have been translating my book. And uh, because I don't have to write a translation, it's my press only, it's just going to be the press, and then they, they, they sign the right with uh, CITEC, and then they translate it, and I don't know the translator. Um, and in the acknowledgement, I, I, uh, I acknowledge a lot of people, including my wife, and then they even got my wife name wrong. And, <laughs> and my wife looked at it, and who is that woman? And it's like that uh, in translation. So I, I, it is an indication that I'm not involved in the translation at all. Uh, after they, they, they translated, sent me that copy, and, oh, yeah, there, there's a translation. And I look at the through it, and because I know this translation thing, that they will change some content. Uh, it is kind of a normal thing for them to do. And, and, uh, and I find that, it's, to my surprise, it's some of the things that I expect that they will change, have to change. For example, that I criticize Xi Jinping's organization uh, policy and things like that. Uh, uh, and then it, it is still there. Uh, and the reference to Lightning 89 is still there. Uh, uh, and then a lot of other things, little things that they change. Uh, for example, there's a subtitle in the trap recorded in the shade, uh, Southeast Asia in the shadow of China. Uh, and then they change the subtitle to Southeast Asia in the lighting of China. So they change from Yi to Guang Yi. That is and that light trail become a lightning. Uh, that is interesting. And another most in, the, the most interesting thing that they change is that uh, whenever I mention capitalism or capitalism in China or Chinese capitalism, they change it every time I mention it into uh, uh, socialist market economy with Chinese characteristics. So uh, so it's no capitalism in China. So you cannot say that it's capitalism in China. That that is actually. Uh, not only ideological BS or, 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 or nonsense that we laugh by, and actually there's some, some uh, uh, interesting insight there. It's very much related to Hong Kong role in the Chinese political economy, and uh, uh, so I would like to start with that. And actually, I uh, has uh, a chapter in this huge book of like, I can't count how many chapters, like, like 30 chapters, 40 chapters. Uh, but it is a very good book, and by Dada Boy and Stephen Chu, and uh, the, the, both my mentor back, back in the CUHK days, and, and Ray Yip. And, and uh, I have a chapter called State Capitalism, Chinese State, State Capitalism in Hong Kong. So it's basically that uh, uh, after today's talk, that uh, you're interested in, you can check that out and then, uh, look at the details of uh, many examples and cases in there. So, why, why the China didn't uh, or uh, still doesn't recognize this capitalism in China. What is what is actually difference? What is the difference uh, between the, the capitalism in China and capitalism elsewhere? So much so that they 
uh, deny the existence of capitalism there. In terms of the economic dynamic, the profit, the profit motivation, uh, the, the accumulation of capital and the imperative that drive the economic system, it is totally capitalist. That uh, is no doubt about it. And what is very different um, uh, that the Chinese uh, economic model or economic system from the rest of the world, and then Hong Kong is important because it is kind of a transition place, is that uh, the private property is still not uh, fully institutionalized or protected. Uh, in, in the socialist constitution, the, the state still owns everything. Uh, if you buy a property and buy a thing that the state still have ownership, you only buy the kind of a use right of uh, the land and, and apartment or anything. Uh, for a period of time, usually 50 years or 30 years or 40 years, and um, so there's no absolute private property rights uh, protection. And and, and, uh, and in the 1990s, during the Jiang era, that they debate about it whether to establish private property right in, in, uh, in the constitution, and, and then they think that it's ideological, it is the, about the political foundation of the Communist Party rule, so it is uh, non negotiable, so they didn't talk. Continue to talk about it. So uh, still, the slow uh, the, the institutionalization and protection of uh, private property rights in the entire economy, a lot like in, in, in other uh, so-called normal capitalist countries, that this uh, private property rights very important. And Hong Kong, uh, the, the, as a continuation of the property relations and the regimes from the British time, it has the protection and institutionalization of private property rights, and, and with the. the we have some complication with the land issues because uh, of the colonial uh, land ownership system. Uh, but besides that, that Hong Kong is a place that is uh, under one country, two system, and the basic law and all that. There is a, a, a protection of private property rights. So uh, in in China, that uh, that is why there's so many wealthy people. Uh, when Chinese economy is growing and and they have a lot of opportunity to make money, that they will. Uh, stay in China, uh, keep the money in China, invest in China, and make money. But uh, uh, as many of them would, would say that uh, only money that is transferred uh, outside of China is uh, your own money. Otherwise, if, uh, if, if uh, you're very wealthy people and all your properties in China is not secure, then uh, the state can confiscate it or there's some, something happening and, and uh, you, you won't have a kind of security of, of owning the thing that you own. So how will become a kind of a gateway or conduit for this uh, money to go to the rest of the world, including uh, uh, Vancouver, definitely, and California, and many other places uh, for wealthy people of China to buy property? And Hong Kong is a gateway uh, of this uh, capital uh, uh, outflow, uh, and definitely that. So it is the impetus of, of my talk and my uh, writing on Hong Kong about this. What's so special about Hong Kong that can control this growth and where it's going to continue? Uh, of course, the reason that I uh, hear about a lot of things about uh, Beijing is uh, impatient about uh, um, uh, the unrest in Hong Kong, so they are again trying to cultivate Shenzhen uh, to replace Hong Kong and things like that. And, and so, in terms of this discourse about Hong Kong role in Chinese economy, uh, just like the protests recently, that uh, there's a lot of misinformation, and, and uh, I uh, have a uh, Second night as a public intellectual writing in Chinese in Hong Kong media and Ningbo and places like that uh, to try to kind of dispel or debunk this kind of uh, myth, but keep dispelling and de debunking that uh, people still uh, very fixated on this kind of misinformation about like uh, the Shenzhen and Shanghai will replace Hong Kong soon as a kind of a financial center and things like that, but it's not going to happen. That that's, that the Financial Times. Uh, recently, has a report that looking at, uh, for example, Shanghai Free uh, Trade Zone that they uh, created a few years ago, and this, at that time, there's a lot of media talk attention, saying that oh, Hong Kong days of the financial center of China's number and all money and all uh, foreign uh, financial institutions and companies going to move to Shanghai, Hong Kong will be uh, kind of abandoned. But then recently, that they they, they have journalists to check out what's happening in, in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, and they find that like. 80 or 90 percent of the office space are empty, and, and there's nothing happening. And another thing is, this uh, Shenzhen has a Qianhai that they have this uh, uh, and near the border of Hong Kong. Also, they try to create a free trade zone to learn all these uh, like HSBC and, and, and bank banks and financial institutions doing business in Hong Kong to go there um, to establish a kind of financial hub in Hong Kong. And, and uh, a lot of media attention was. Uh, 
uh, you can find like 10 years away, people probably think that the Shanghai is going to replace Hong Kong. But again, that uh, you check what is happening in Shanghai, the, the result is nothing is happening. Uh, and actually, last time I checked that the most frightening business of Shanghai is that they, they have this kind of shopping mall that sells baby formula milk, you can the baby formula milk. <laughs> Uh, tax free, so it's quite popular. And so it is, that is it, and that's all finance. Uh, so, so there's some claim that um, that Hong Kong cannot be replaced uh, in this regard, and, and no matter how hard they try, that they cannot gain in Hong Kong in mainland China. And uh, there's a lot of misinformation, information definitely. That, uh, for example, uh, it is better now that uh, because of the, the, the recent rise and all the discussion, that people finally realize. Uh, Many of the very common sense kind of uh, misinformation is actually false. For example, there's a lot of uh, the, uh, people saying that Hong Kong has low negotiation power with mainland China and Beijing because Hong Kong is so dependent on China on everything, food and water and all this kind of stuff. But actually, it's not true. That you look at the data, that rise, that Hong Kong uh, more than seventy percent, actually eighty uh, percent, I think, is something that rise from Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Thailand and Vietnam as well, and, and actually. Uh, mainland China start to import rice uh, from uh, Southeast Asia by Hong Kong and uh, and uh, frozen meat and all this meat and I think they're from Australia, from, from uh, Brazil, from America and fruits also from Southeast Asia, seafood also from Southeast Asia. The only item that uh, Hong Kong really rely on um, mainland China, the food item, uh, we are not talking about finance and other things, we are talking about these groceries items. Uh, it's only the live chicken, uh, and uh, green vegetables um, that that uh, overwhelmingly they depend on the mainland China supply. But, uh, so I always say that that in my experience, why the young people in Hong Kong is, uh, don't give a damn to to this uh, economic dependence on China because uh, young people don't like green vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't eat live chicken. They eat processed food. They don't care when it's live chicken, slaughtered and let it run out. I think that's all the people. Who, very important for them. But, but for young people, they don't care. They, they eat frozen meat from America, and they eat uh, uh, frozen lobster from Australia, and things like that. So, in, in terms of food, they really don't think that they rely on them. We're going to try to Food and water is another thing that uh, Hong Kong is paying a lot of money to buy this uh, Dongjiang River water and then pay another big sum of money to, to, to make this dirty water into to drinkable water. And uh, in places like Israel and Singapore, that don't uh, have uh, fresh water supply that they already uh, rely on the uh, desalination of ocean water for drinking water and it's allowed the technology is very mature and very cheap uh, and recently Lika Singh is talking about something to do with it finally and then Hong Kong government is with it but uh, actually that uh, it can easily be done uh, without buying water from Guangdong and, and, and the, the problem of buying water from Guangdong is that even if there's a good rain year that Hong Kong doesn't need that much Water, they still have to buy a certain amount of water from Guangdong and then pour most of them into uh, the ocean, uh, uh, still create money. Uh, so it is this kind of myth about Hong Kong total dependence on, on China is, is, is something that's stick in people and even in many people in Hong Kong and even in opposition, uh, they have this conception that need to be debunked. And, and we are just talking about this uh, grocery item. Also, if we go to talk about finance, it is very uh, uh, Australian that actually it is uh, uh, in some way that the mainland China is more dependent on Hong Kong than Hong Kong dependent on, on China. That uh, I, I I was told that uh, that uh, I need to leave a lot of time for discussion. So I I people who came to my talk yesterday know that I have this tendency to keep talking uh, for hours and don't have to restrain myself to skip some of the slide here. Um, uh, I just give this uh, slide with my uh, good friend Lenny with a cat. Uh, but basically, um, and also, uh, I talk about it, we never really talk about this kind of ordering China thing. That right now, um, China's economic uh, slowdown is very obvious. Like, like when my book was first out in 2015, um, uh, I keep telling people that China's economy is going to slow down. Uh, it's inevitable and it's going to be very bad and there's the financial instability at that time that nobody believed in me and then like uh, in one conference when, when Justin Yifu was there and then he's still talking about this China potentially can have 20 more years at least of uh, above 5% economic growth. Uh, of course now he revised his, uh, his plan and after the economic growth official data showed that it is much lower than 5% but back in 2015 
uh, he's still saying that, and I have to like debate with this kind of field. Uh, but now I don't need to, uh, to convince you that the Chinese economy is not doing very well. And one consequence of the Chinese economy is not doing very well is that um, uh, in the second graph, you see that um, um, there is a lot of uh, external debt going on. Uh, that is the, the green, the green thing, that the green line that we look at is that uh, China has been known for uh, quite free from external debt. Uh, it is the strength of the Chinese economy, uh, not until, but only until recently. After 2008, actually, that uh, China stock of external debt uh, rose pretty uh, rapidly, and most of them are corporate debt. And uh, uh, the debt actually the race, and, and there's again a recent Financial Times article saying that 75 percent is uh, from Hong Kong. Uh, so basically, it's uh, state -owned enterprise and, and Chinese companies going to Hong Kong to lock the door on. Uh, as, as you are following the news and uh, uh, paying attention to the stock market and this uh, different company's performance, you know that the Bank of East Asia is the bank in Hong Kong that is uh, most exposed to this uh, China's uh, debt problem. Uh, but not only Bank of East Asia, it's actually a while ago that they have this stress test of these different banks. They just basically try to understand that they all have this business with uh, lending money, uh, many of them in uh, US dollar or in Hong Kong dollar, which is actually uh, kind of equivalent to US dollar because of the currency pack. Uh, so a lot of these kind of corporate external debt is in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, you see that uh, uh, China and FDI let inflow, which is actually all for uh, uh, inflow minus uh, outflow that uh, before like for of a cliff uh, after uh, 2010, 2012. So it, uh, it means that there's uh, a lot of outflow of capital from China. Uh, the inflow is constant or slightly declining, but uh, the, the, the fall of the left inflow is basically is increasing outflow. Uh, and also, the foreign exchange reserve in China is also dropping uh, after the 2015 devaluation um, uh, and the stock market trouble in, in Shanghai uh, and Shenzhen as well. Um, so, you see that the current shape of the Chinese economy is that it's no longer doing as good as uh, it used to be. Uh, many corporations are uh, struggling to raise uh, external debt uh, out from outside lender, uh, mostly in Hong Kong. And there is an uh, increasing outflow of capital uh, from China that uh, there's a lot of innovative way, way of uh, uh, capital outflow, but again, the, the, the most uh, common and popular way is actually also through Hong Kong. And you look at some data about uh, China's uh, global outward direct investment. Um, so here, that, as you know that if you work on a China official statistic, that all this uh, Chinese data doesn't include uh, Hong Kong. They separate Hong Kong from the, uh, from the, uh, from the mainland Chinese economy. And uh, so in terms of stock and flow, in terms of stock, uh, China is the only developing countries uh, that is in the top 10 capital exporter, meaning that is, uh, China is no longer uh, a major absorber of foreign capital. Uh, because in uh, in, in this state of reform in the 1980s and 1990s, China is known as the biggest absorber of foreign direct investment into China. But now China is also a major capital exporter. They, they, they export capital. Uh, there's capital outflow all of China. Uh, and China stock, that's the, the accumulated amount of uh, capital, is already is only developing countries among the top 10 uh, capital exporter in the world. Uh, if you measure in stock, if you measure in annual flow, China is actually the second biggest uh, capital exporter now, um, and only after USA. And uh, uh, I think it's still the second. Uh, the, the data is not uh, very updated because the Ministry of Commerce in China publishes the data every year. Um, so China is a major capital exporter, and of course, that uh, the problem is how to disaggregate this kind of capital export. What are they? Um, the, they are they are coming from direct investment, but in the foreign direct investment, a lot of them are actually real estate investment. Uh, the money pulled out from China uh, uh, into real estate market, I think, in, in, being in British Columbia. That, that's a discussion about this for capital coming into British Columbia to buy properties. A lot of them, of course, is uh, Chinese capital. Uh, same in Hong Kong, uh, but not necessarily all of them are individual capital. For example, uh, the uh, Hainan Airlines, HNA, that they are buying a lot of lands and they beat up the prices of uh, government land in Hong Kong. So there's a lot of this kind of capital also. Uh, the, and real estate is a large part of it, but of course there are many other, uh, like buying companies, uh, merchant acquisition, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but if you look at the this aggregation of uh, the destination of this capital offer, it's very interesting because um, 
uh, Hong Kong is actually the major destination of this capital outflow. Then in terms of stock, uh, 60% are, uh, of this China foreign outgoing foreign IMF is in Hong Kong. Uh, and the second and the third uh, is actually all these uh, tax havens, this uh, Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, uh, United States of uh, distant fall, and in terms of pro and the pro. Uh, as of uh, the end 2016, the Hong Kong is still top. Uh, is uh, also 60% uh, of uh, outflow of Chinese uh, foreign direct investment, and up in Hong Kong, uh, and then followed by um, again Cayman Islands, which Virgin Islands, and and and, and United States. Uh, 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 well, then, and uh, of course, it is kind of intuitive because uh, Canada is way down, but it's kind of uh, contrary to our conception. There's a lot of China money is coming to Canada, but it has something to do with this Hong Kong role because many money arrive in Hong Kong, they just stay there forever. Uh, Hong Kong is a kind of routing place for this money to go somewhere else, uh, and and uh, and then it is uh, interesting to compare. But, but it's very difficult because uh, Hong Kong government published the statistics about this Hong Kong over investment. But this over investment, they didn't disaggregate whether how much is that uh, actually trying to originate capital, how much of the actual decasting and all this Hong Kong local capital. But uh, you can sense about what is going on is that uh, Hong Kong is a place that um, this uh, Chinese outgoing money, the first stop is Hong Kong. And it's the same as the uh, Money that from outside world to go into China. That uh, if you look at the foreign direct investment going into China, seventy percent are from Hong Kong. So uh, again, there's a lot all of this capital from Hong Kong going into China. Actually, Hong Kong capital. Many of them are Taiwan, Japan, uh, European capital. But they establish a foothold and assume a Hong Kong identity and then go back to the mainland China. And also, there's some round tripping in that uh, statistic. There's some uh, Chinese company. Invest in Hong Kong and set up a subsidiary or, or, or company in Hong Kong, and then assume after they assume the Hong Kong identity, they pile the money back into mainland China as a Hong Kong capital and enjoy all these kind of uh, uh, policy uh, uh, favors uh, given to foreign direct investment or foreign direct investor. Uh, so it's very complicated. But in the outflow, uh, this ground tripping is not an issue. That uh, I don't believe a lot of uh, people. Uh, 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 move money to Hong Kong and then uh, and then assume Hong Kong identity and, 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 and go back to China and things like that. And many of them are actually for going out to somewhere else. And some of them stay in Hong Kong, but some of them are going out. And uh, so financially, uh, uh, Hong Kong is a very important gateway for global capital going into China or uh, Chinese capital going out. It still is. And and uh, Shenzhen and Shanghai. Uh, can never replace Hong Kong, and though uh, from 10 years ago when they start talking about Shanghai, and also a few years ago, I think it's five years ago, talking about the Shanghai P trade zone, they want to replace it, but it never happened. Uh, because there's something uh, 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 ticking or kicking about Hong Kong that is very different from, from the, the rest of mainland China. That one thing is this. Uh, now people know about it, and, but uh, before this year, they were like, oh, about this 1992 Hong Kong policy act of the US. Uh, and there's a lot of equivalent uh, legislature in different countries and, and places. Uh, um, for example, I, I talked to uh, the Japanese scholar who used to be a uh, uh, Japanese diplomat uh, during hangover in Hong Kong. Um, and he was in the Japan uh, embassy in, in uh, his, uh, political council there. Uh, after the time in the school, I was in the about this uh, where Japan has this equivalent law. Is that, that Japan didn't have that law, but in practice, it's following like the US um, kind of uh, practice that is uh, separate Hong Kong on visa, immigration, and uh, capital control, and investment, and everything else from mainland China. So it is a standard that the, the US uh, Hong Kong Policy Act in 1992. Uh, with the expectation of the sovereign handover of the line in 1997, um, um, is that uh, uh, so I have this kind of a tax on that policy act, but, but uh, actually, the, the most important thing is that uh, in 1992, uh, that the US Congress passed the law, and that uh, it, it actually it has been the law that regulates US Hong Kong relations. And, and uh, ever since 1997, it's still very important until recently, as we follow the news, we realize that they are renewing it. We have a stronger law that is the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, but basically it's the same idea. That is, uh, uh, under this law, who has this uh, 
uh, treating Hong Kong uh, as a different economic entity, um, or even political entity from mainland China, um, provided that Hong Kong is uh, verified as having sufficient autonomy from mainland China in terms of governance, in terms of uh, civil rights, and in terms of uh, uh, legal, judicial, independent, that is, was one country to say something. So, a part of that uh, China official position about this is that it is. Uh, um, uh, an appropriate intervention of uh, Chinese internal affairs by the U.S., but actually China benefited a lot from this law that so far as U.S. recognized uh, that after 1997 they are going to treat Hong Kong separately from mainland China. Uh, so if you are uh, applying for visa or green card, everything that so the Hong Kong people from Hong Kong and people from mainland China from different lines, uh, the, the line for Hong Kong, Hong Kong is uh, much shorter. So it's why. Uh, many people who have this kind of a migration purpose and things like that, and they, they will, uh, many mainland uh, uh, officials or their families, and they will have a kind of a, like people, like even some journalists find that they can't wait and order and things like that, and they, they're all Hong Kongers. And uh, they are sort of Hong Kong identity because after you have a Hong Kong identity and using a Hong Kong passport, that you go to migration, getting visa, and everything else is much easier. Uh, not only the US, because the uh, US has an example. Um, and many other countries just follow the, the practice. And uh, the condition is that uh, Hong Kong is sufficiently autonomous. Uh, but uh, as you know, that for a long time, that is uh, kind of a toothless tiger. That uh, uh, the, the US State Department routinely uh, say that Hong Kong is sufficiently autonomous until this year. Like last year, the State Department report Hong Kong start talking about that uh, there's a possibility that a sufficient autonomy may be moving to another direction, that there's a, uh, a chance that the US will no longer verify the Hong Kong sufficient autonomous citing all this cross-border kidnapping and all these kind of issues. Uh, but but until very recently, that is just ritualistic and formalistic uh, uh, verification by the US when the US and China um, relation is good, uh, so the uh, US uh, just turned the right to anything happening in Hong Kong that sounds like uh, Hong Kong is less and less autonomous but still uh, verified autonomy and it's very important not, not only visa, uh, capital, but we're going, I'm going to talk about a few cases, interesting case that uh, if you are a Hong Kong company, you have a Hong Kong identity, you invest in the US again, uh, all our allies of US like the five highest countries, I think, including Canada and, and, and Australia and all these other countries, that if you're Hong Kong capital, uh, you face much less uh, scrutiny. Uh, if you're a Chinese company, publicly state company, that uh, they, they ban a lot of this investment uh, from Chinese entities um, on national security ground. But if you have a Hong Kong uh, uh, identity, then then if you're a Hong Kong company, it is just treated as another easy uh, economy, so it's very easy. Until very recently, again, that uh, and other thing that is very important to export uh, control. Uh, I always tell people that why all this uh, Thomas high tech firm in China, the one more concentrated in Shenzhen. Uh, why what is so special about Shenzhen? Many people think that oh, uh, uh, Silicon Valley in, in, in the U.S. and uh, because of the university system and, and, and also this great research facility. But in Shenzhen, you don't have great universities. Uh, not as good as picking university, for example. If you uh, think that China is going to be a high tech company, you will expect that Dunguan Chuan will be a high tech. It is in some way, but, but uh, in the end, it's all these uh, most important high tech companies are now concentrated in, in, in Shenzhen. And uh, even though Shenzhen didn't have a, the key uh, universities in the Chinese education, higher education system, uh, one reason, the many reasons, is this proximity to Hong Kong. And because there's a lot of uh, high tech equipment. That uh, is classified as a uh, civilian and military dual use technology uh, that include a lot of software and hardware that can be classified in this way. A ban from exporting to China. That's if you're a Chinese company, mainland China, you just cannot get this equipment. Uh, but Hong Kong, under the Hong Kong, uh, US Hong Kong Policy Act, Hong Kong is exempt from it. Um, so, what is happening is that a lot of these kind of uh, Chinese high tech company that they are establishing subsidiary. In Hong Kong, to import all this equipment uh, uh, is important for them to develop their, their uh, hardware or software technology. So they have lab in Hong Kong, and some of them collaborate with uh, uh, with uh, some universities in Hong Kong to have the lab uh, that that uh, research on a lot of things that require all this kind of equipment that China uh, banned from uh, importing. Um, and uh, 
So as the Huawei case of uh, Sabrina Mom case show that you know that this kind of uh, uh, equipment that uh, Huawei imported and then transshipped to Iran and other places allegedly uh, are through this uh, satellite uh, alleged satellite uh, uh, companies uh, that Huawei set up in Hong Kong. So it is this kind of a U.S. Uh, Hong Kong policy act uh, enabled it to happen. So Hong Kong has been always a backdoor that uh, whenever there's any kind of uh, uh, sanctions. Uh, that uh, against China, that they, they, that this sanction is not effective, uh, and, and, and when U.S. China relation is good, that U.S. actually I think they return Brian to 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 allow China to get everything that they cannot get otherwise uh, through Hong Kong under the U.S. Hong Kong policy. Act. Again, that uh, uh, it's just an part example of uh, um, uh, other countries uh, are following the same uh, uh, kind of uh, practice. Um, to uh, uh, to separate Hong Kong from mainland China in this kind of export control and trade and things like that, and um, so another thing is that uh, all this kind of uh, uh, economic organization like the WTO, of uh, course WHO and all, Hong Kong and mainland China have separate uh, membership and Macau also has a membership. It's very interesting that in WTO, for example, it's one country three voting members. So uh, Macau, Hong Kong, and, and, and mainland China have, have three members uh, memberships in the WTO, and uh, Hong Kong because uh, uh, participated in the formation of the WTO in 1994 95 So Hong Kong is actually a founding member of the WTO. That China only joined in 2001, and uh, the terms of China being in WTO in the global trading system and Hong Kong place in the global trading system is very different. Um, that uh, for example. Uh, uh, China, um, uh, according to its uh, entry into WTO terms, that China is still not opening its financial system. Uh, its currency is not fully convertible, while Hong Kong, as a member of WTO, is fully open its financial system to foreign uh, full ownership operation by foreign financial firms. Um, and uh, currencies in Hong Kong is fully convertible. So it uh, creates a kind of a, a situation in which China can have the happiest uh, situation in both world. So China, you know why China, um, it's obvious why China is reluctant to open up its financial system because I think that it is a kind of a national economic security issue. So if you open up the financial system, that foreign banks to lend to China's enterprise, and it is a kind of a situation in which um, uh, China would be like other developing countries becoming very much in debt to all these foreign companies. So China is very reluctant to liberalize the capital account. Uh, but the drawback of this situation is then, then Chinese uh, top companies and Chinese uh, wealthy people and Chinese officials that they cannot enjoy the financial wealth management service of many financial firms. Uh, and uh, Hong Kong created a kind of a uh, kind of a uh, offshore financial center um, uh, for China, so that uh, on the one hand China can maintain its closure of the financial system, at the same time the people can still enjoy fully the financial service and uh, the wealth management service and, and, and uh, capital uh, raising service and all this kind of thing in, in Hong Kong as a totally financially free system. So again, this kind of separation, uh, legal separation between uh, Hong Kong and mainland China is very important and, and China has been using it uh, to its benefit. Um, so I don't have time to go over all this, but um, um, And also another thing is that this the kind of international arbitration that if you have business to build. Uh, so there's this kind of New York Convention on the Recognition of Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards that is uh, if you have business to build. Uh, the members of this convention, uh, uh, any court or any arbitration uh, institution that, that did this kind of arbitration of business to build and then the result or the penalty or whatever uh, apply to all other members uh, uh, countries or economies, and then China has not been uh, part of it. Uh, so it is a deterrence of uh, or discouraging fact that uh, when you uh, do business in China, it will be uh, very risky because if you have a business uh, dispute with a Chinese partner, then, then uh, you only rely on the Chinese court that don't, people don't think that it's totally fair to foreign enterprise. So the, again, then the uh, remedy is that Hong Kong is a member of this convention. So a lot of uh, people investing in China uh, when they have business dispute, that they uh, go to the Hong Kong uh, arbitration um, 
uh, uh, institutions of court to settle the dispute, and, and then uh, China and Hong Kong separately signed this agreement that uh, 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 reciprocal, reciprocal enforcement and arbitral awards between China and China. So basically, um, there's a lot of this kind of uh, 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 example. Uh, I don't have time to go over all of it, but. Uh, and then, in a lot of cases, that is uh, how Hong Kong is important uh, uh, because of this uh, uh, separation from Hong Kong from mainland China and the US law and many other places. That is, uh, one of these examples that people don't realize is the, the, the building of the first aircraft carrier, that is the Liao Ling. And without Hong Kong, it's very difficult for China to get the, that uh, Ukraine um, decommissioned, it, um, uh, decommissioned aircraft carrier to drag it to, to China and then to retrofit it and turn it into the Liaoning today. Uh, it still had a lot of problems, but actually it, uh, and it was still destroyed in the late 1990s. And uh, after the Soviet collapse, and, and there's a former PLA president and set up a company, an entertainment company in Hong Kong. Uh, in 1989, and, and the guy went to uh, Ukraine to try to buy two aircraft carriers, the commissioned aircraft carrier. And of course, if it is a Chinese state-owned company or PLA-related company, go to Ukraine to try to buy the aircraft carrier. And all these, uh, for example, CIA, all these kinds of things, they, 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 it is in their way to screen, they stop it from happening and would bid for the aircraft carrier, make sure that it won't fall in the hand of the Chinese company. But at that time, nobody realized and nobody paid attention because it's an entertainment company from Hong Kong. Find that two decommissioned uh, aircraft carrier. One is um, that they have become the only other in the means, and then it is an entertainment company because uh, the reason that uh, the company is saying that why they're buying the aircraft carrier because they want to make a free park. Uh, and it, it actually is one of it, the means has been a has been a film park in Shenzhen for a long time that uh, is now 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 done with. But when when the means and, and so they turned one into the Liaoning, the other one really turned all into the film park. So in Shenzhen for a while that they have this kind of floating uh, film park or aircraft carrier. They hire some like Russian lady wearing bikini dancing and and and, and serving some fatty food and things like that. And and, and in Shenzhen for a while. So but this entertainment company just uh, didn't raise eyebrows and, or, or, or get in the winning screen of the of many many US company. So it can uh, uh, smoothly the transaction is done. The one uh, uh, he put, acquired these two aircraft carrier. He transferred one to to PLA and then it turned into Liao Ling. And it was in the news recently. Actually, you can check that out. The South China Morning Post has a huge story about this Liao Ling because the guy still had got paid by PLA. That uh, <laughs> he bought the aircraft carrier and transferred to PLA and the PLA didn't pay. And uh, so he's like companion and things like that. And SM has a big story about it. But anyway, so we've done this Hong Kong identity. This Hong Kong company buy two aircraft carriers to turn into film parks and, 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 and it is uh, very inconvenient if, if it is a Chinese company, a PR company, a Chinese company that are doing it. The Lagrava Canal is another example, but it is no longer existing. That, uh, that, that at some point, there's uh, Hong Kong <coughs> trying to open the Lagrava Canal to bypass the Panama Canal and again, that uh, uh, it is actually not a Hong Kong company, it is a, a Chinese financier, an open company in Hong Kong, and using Hong Kong identity to negotiate, but it's no longer there. And then uh, uh, friends will actually check at the address of, uh, of that company that do this legal work and they'll try to find that actually the, the, the office is empty, everything is gone, everybody is gone. And another case is unverified. It, um, unverified the list. Uh, it is actually, uh, I already talked about it, that is this uh, export control. And uh, the U.S. keep a list of companies around the world, and it turns out a lot of these companies um, on that list actually is a blacklist. Blacklist uh, are Hong Kong companies with Hong Kong address, and actually some journalists in Hong Kong actually check on them and, and, and find that there are many of them are actually the, 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 the subsidiary of Chinese companies or the, the, the owners of the companies are in Pinyin. They that they are they are making a trial, but they establish a company in Hong Kong to import all this uh, uh, because the export control regime is that uh, uh, China cannot import all this technology from the U.S. It's sensitive technology. Uh, uh, the countries that uh, or economies that import this technology, like Hong Kong, that you need to is why the U.S. Uh, U.S. consulate in Hong Kong hires so many people because they need to check where the equipments are. Uh, every year, they check whether it's still there or whether it's being transferred to mainland China or North Korea or Iran. 
Uh, but of course, there's uh, constantly understaffed, and they don't have uh, enough people to track everything. And and but if they track and find out that uh, we import this kind of uh, uh, high tech equipment into Hong Kong, and then later on you cannot account for where it went, um, then we will go on a bad list. Uh, so it is so called a very vital entity list uh, of the U.S. They have this government, uh, the com Commerce Department have this website uh, maintaining, updating this list. A lot of these companies are actually uh, from Hong Kong. And what is happening? Then people find out is that they, they uh, many Chinese uh, company or, or officials or official related uh, people just uh, have these companies and then import this stuff from the U.S. and then transfer it to somewhere else, maybe, and, and if they found out and practice it, they just uh, fold it. Uh, and then we open another uh, company with another name and things like that, okay, do this kind of thing. Uh, so it is, again, that impossible uh, to happen uh, without uh, Hong Kong special treatment under the U.S. law and, and the global uh, commercial community. But there's a lot of case, again, that I can't uh, talk about, but this Orient overseas Case is interesting because all in offices is related to Dong and, uh, and and they uh, actually acquire a container terminal and facilities in Long Beach. And these kind of container facilities are regarded as very sensitive and, and uh, related to national security. If it's a Chinese company, they won't let it happen. But uh, it happened as a kind of Hong Kong company. It was in the news lately because uh, uh, now the US China relation is not so good and the US is cracking down on this. Uh, uh, China using Hong Kong identity to buy strategic assets and facilities in the US, so they uh, force uh, the Orient offices to sell the facility because they find that all Orient offices as a Hong Kong company actually is the majority stakeholder of the Chinese state company. Um, another example is Australia that, uh, that uh, recently banned a Hong Kong company, actually a Lee Hansen company, uh, bid for gas pipeline. Uh, in the past, all Hong Kong companies have no problem investing in these infrastructures of uh, UK or Australia, but recently again, Australia relation with China is turning sour, and they suddenly pay attention to this issue that uh, Hong Kong company uh, they suspect is uh, the, the, that uh, Chinese uh, capital is behind and things like that, and uh, they no longer distinguish Hong Kong company from China company. So things are changing, uh, but it is uh, so far. Um, uh, another thing is the international laundering and smuggling that uh, uh, it is now very. Hard for overseas people like myself that, that, that to maintain and keep an account in Hong Kong with the U.S. Uh, address and things like that because uh, they are cracking down on these uh, potential laundering cases. You need to provide all information to them. Uh, so it's a reaction to the Obama administration uh, discovery that actually um, that a lot of uh, people are using Hong Kong opening up account for this money laundering. But now the government, Hong Kong government, is trying to take care of it and respond to U.S. government's. Uh, uh, concern about this uh, laundering and also smuggling is also I don't uh, have time to talk about uh, capital market. Uh, as you know, that I don't need to go into detail. But the Hong Kong stock market become a major place where a lot of uh, Chinese companies are uh, raising uh, capital, uh, offering uh, in, in the initial public offerings, and and all these activities uh, in the form of uh, exchange or red chips. Uh, uh, so they are all Chinese company, many of them stay on it. Uh, so it is a major offshore financial center for them to raise capital. Um, and, and the very last thing is this uh, RMB internationalization. Again, that uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, RMB uh, trying uh, going to replace the U.S. dollar as a common currency in the world. I keep telling people that it's not going to happen, uh, but people still think that it's going to happen a few years ago because it seems that the use of RMB has been rising. Uh, is included in the IMF um, special drawing rights and basket of currency that it moved to the, the top five most used international uh, currency in international transaction. But after that, that actually you see that uh, it's the latest data is that it's, uh, it's fall down outside of the top five. It's now ranked number eight in terms of um, the use international use of RMB. Again, that this kind of international use of RMB is impossible without Hong Kong because you look at the Actual uh, international transaction involving human being very, very constantly. Uh, more than seventy percent of transactions in Hong Kong. Uh, many of them are actually not trade tri financing uh, for US dollar and euros and many other uh, currency. Uh, all these kind of international transactions of this currency are, uh, are related to trade financing. But the uh, um, uh, transaction of money in Hong Kong, uh, many of them are actually mom and pop investment. That uh, they think that RMB is appreciating, so they spend a lot of their savings in the RMB and 
uh, speculate on where we get appreciations. So a lot of this kind of transaction are like that. And, and 70 percent, more than 70 percent of RMB international uses actually happen in Hong Kong. Yeah, uh, and you, you, you take out the Hong Kong uh, part of it, and then the international use of RMB uh, actually is less used uh, than, for example, the Polish currency. Uh, type of, and, 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 uh, is, it used to be in the top five and still in the top ten rank number eight just because of a lot of transactions going on in Hong Kong. So it's again that uh, Hong Kong is a kind of a way to, uh, for China to bypass its concentration. concentration. For example, China want to internationalize the use of RMB um, uh, as a kind of a, to get away from the dollar, US dollar, and Germany. But at the same time, China doesn't want to make RMB freely convertible. And doesn't want to open up its financial uh, uh, sector fully for uh, uh, security reason. Uh, so the middle, uh, the happy middle of uh, uh, remedy for it to 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 internationalize the UN while not opening up uh, uh, its uh, financial market is to use Hong Kong and accumulate a pool of remedy in Hong Kong. So the remedy in Hong Kong, the pool of remedy in Hong Kong is needed free convert. Uh, if, if you have a lot of rugby, then you can uh, go to Hong Kong Bank, open an account, and then you can change um, to other currency. Uh, so this the uh, rugby market in Hong Kong is different from the rugby market in mainland China. So uh, Hong Kong is being used as a kind of very important gateway for rugby internationalization. So it's just another example. And um, in the end, that, um, uh, that Hong Kong has a lot of uh, playing and most of all financial uh, function uh, as an offshore financial market for China that uh, uh, China uh, en enable China to participate in the world trading system and the world financial system without fully opening its own uh, uh, market. So as Tan Xiao Ping uh, uh, and met with uh, Gorbachev and Gorbachev kept saying that uh, uh, China is not to Hong Kong and, and, and it was the, the situation in 1989 and it, the situation still is that uh, China can, um, can uh, close down a lot of things and not let the uh, foreigner to get into it, but at the same time they still can fully integrate it to the global uh, economic system through Hong Kong. And again, that this kind of offshore financial center role of Hong Kong uh, is not going to be replaced by Shanghai and Shenzhen because uh, we cannot create a free trade zone of financial center in Shanghai and still enjoy, for example, the exemption of export control of the U.S. Uh, it's a legacy of the colonial times uh, uh, and, and guaranteed by one country to system and the sign of British joint declaration. Uh, without this kind of institutionally, internationally legal uh, guarantee that uh, no uh, mainland uh, China city can replace Hong Kong in this regard. And so uh, the last thing I want to raise is that, that there's a lot of talk about this uh, destruction of Hong Kong in the recent unrest. Um, and if it is the case, uh, unfortunately, the, if it happened, then I always tell people that you ask uh, wealthy people, in, Chinese people from mainland China in Hong Kong and or some uh, corporations, Chinese corporations uh, have investment in Hong Kong, if Hong Kong is destroyed and if you think Hong Kong is no longer safe, so are you, where are you going to go? Uh, are you going to move your oil and money back to mainland China or are you go to Singapore or London or other places? And I think the answer is quite obvious that if you go further away, it's already happened. The data is showing that a lot of money is starting to flow off Hong Kong to Singapore. Think uh, place farther than Hong Kong uh, from China. So if the destruction of the Hong Kong financial center status uh, in Hong Kong for political reason, uh, then Hong Kong will, uh, China will lose, will lose uh, a financial center under its sovereignty. And then uh, there will be still offshore financial center. There's still a lot of Chinese wealthy people and company need financial service. But uh, the, 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 the fame, the, the, the place where this transition happened will no longer be in Hong Kong or any other place within Chinese sovereignty, but far away, like uh, outside of Chinese sovereignty, like uh, uh, Singapore or London or things like that. So a lot is at stake here, not only for Hong Kong, but also for uh, the prospect of development of China. Uh, in with regard to this kind of political future of Hong Kong and the economic financial future of Hong Kong. So I better stop here and then uh, if you have any question about any of the points I can I'm happy to discuss. Thank you.
questions. I would like to give priority to students. So if there are students who have questions, then we can have a round of questions from students first. Sorry, are, you? No. are there any questions from students? So, uh, do you think that, uh, unlike after the October first, there uh, are like, uh, like the seventy standards we are seeing? So, after that, do you think we will crash down to the protest? Uh, because, as you mentioned about, it's a uh, Mostly, it's about the economic reasons, right? But for the Communist Party, we probably see the uh, political security mm -hmm. more than the economic. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Aspect. Yeah. Let's take a round of questions. Um, are there any other student questions? Yes, at the back. Uh, uh, it's like the, um, so. It's like, especially given like the current situation, it's like people don't really trust the situation, like the uh, like the credibility of Hong Kong's going down. It's like if this goes on, it's like uh, what do you think the impact on the like on the Chinese economy will be, like the Hong Kong's yeah, like it's the reputation of Hong Kong's totally yeah. Um, I like the yellow shirt. Uh, I've recently read a commentary um, talking about the relationship between China's economy and also the um, tycoon in Hong Kong, Mr. Li Kaisheng, um, yeah. talking about how Li Kaisheng would treat all his money and assets in China and how it impacts the, uh, China's economy. Um, so I'd like to know more about your views on, especially after these few months of protests, how is the dyna dynamic between China and also tycoons in Hong Kong? Li Kaisheng is not only the it's not the only rich man in Hong Kong. So how would their relationship with dynamics impact China's economy? Okay, one last question from support. Uh, my question <coughs> is that uh, when China benefits from uh, relative independence of Hong Kong, why it's trying to uh, spread its grip over Hong Kong? What, why again? Why again? Uh, uh, my question is that uh, you, you are saying that China benefits from independence of Hong Kong. But, but why they are trying to uh, strengthen the grief or spread the grief or so what's the reason? Okay, so we'll yeah, I, I, I can't take more at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but I try to answer all at once that uh, um, uh, prediction is very hard and actually I, I'm afraid uh, who that predicting thing of how can the expected trying to be slow down and, and I also predict that PLA won't uh, crush Hong Kong when in the summer everybody is saying that PLA is coming very soon, things like that. But anyway, but but it's very hard to predict this kind of situation because like in June, right before uh, the whole protest started, and I was uh, uh, teaching a kind of intensive class in, in, in Taiwan. Uh, in the class in graduate classes and, and a couple of uh, accolades, uh, the, the very enthusiastic students from mainland China and they're asking me uh, what's going to happen because it, the, the, the June 9 first massive demonstration is to be planned and that student is saying that they want to travel to Hong Kong to, to have a feeling of uh, this demonstration and they're concerned about whether the extradition bill will be passed and things like that. At that time I like um, very cold and say that no, don't don't waste your time. That it's just protest and protest, and then they still pass it. And, and nobody expect that that, that actually that uh, they suspend it and later on they draw the bill. So it's very difficult to predict. And we we try to whether uh, try to push Hong Kong hard after October first. I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't want to predict, and I don't try to predict it. But uh, definitely there's two dynamics there, and then respond to the, the at the same time the last question. Why try to want to to increase the grip of Hong Kong, of course, that, that they, uh, by the nature of the regime, that they have fear of any people who are not totally in line, and, and uh, they're always suspecting the people in Hong Kong are uh, rebellious and wanting <coughs> independence or uh, working together with other foreign powers and to bring down the Communist Party. And that is the, the constant fear. And uh, so, uh, uh, for a long time, they're trying to trying to push the effort, just like in, in many other places. So trying to see another, another, another issue is that they increase the control of Hong Kong 
with Donald crossing the red line that will make U.S. revoke the recognition and other countries revoke the recognition of Hong Kong as a separate entity. So, uh, so far as you keep increasing control and not revoking or making any other major Western country revoke the recognition of Hong Kong as a separate entity from from mainland China, so the Beijing will get the best of both worlds. That is, uh, you have control and then you also continue to enjoy the benefit. So it is the plan, it has been the plan. Uh, but this plan only works when the US China relation is relatively good and the US is very much willing to turn the blind eye to all this increasing control and increasing autonomy. Um, so they are, but, but now that, or, or, or so far, that the, the red line is that PRA cannot cross the border to Kuala Hong Kong and then. then Using crisis that uh, actually it's very interesting that there's a June 12th, you can track up the report that uh, Reuters has that report that June 12th, uh, there's a big conflict that forced the Hong government to suspend the extradition bill. Um, and then June 13th, I forgot whether June 13th or June 14th, uh, incidentally, there is a US Pacific commander uh, or US general visiting the uh, Hong Kong garrison of the PLA and then uh, meet with this they, they say the kind of a routine um, courtesy visit uh, and then in that meeting according to the report that somebody leaked to the uh, I think it's a US side that the information is that this uh, PLA the general in the Hong Kong garrison guaranteed the US Pacific commander one of the generals that uh, don't, don't worry that uh, PLA won't innovate and he will uh, allow Hong Kong police and Hong Kong government to do the job so so they, they, they know the red line is, is, is this PLA. So uh, uh, once PLA cross the border, then they go uh, immediately book uh, all this kind of special treatment of Hong Kong vis-a-vis -vis Ming and China. But of course, we have the, 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 I don't know how to have time to talk about our US-China relation is turning sour, not only Donald Trump, but also uh, the Congress. I always say that Donald Trump is the easier uh, not to crack from a China perspective. Uh, if you have to deal with Donald Trump, make a deal with him. The Congress, the, the Congress is more aggressively. Not friendly to China, so uh, you look at all this kind of a bill regarding Taiwan and regarding Hong Kong. So now they're doing more, more things, and the red line is is like expanding. Um, so uh, when China still want to increase control, that it has uh, uh, a bigger dilemma about uh, whether to increase control at the expense of uh, uh, increasing uh, with the kind of condition of increasing risk of uh, U.S. and other countries. Uh, revoking revocation of uh, the recognition of uh, uh, the, the separate uh, identity of Hong Kong, and uh, so it is a tough choice uh, from uh, the, the perspective of Xi Jinping maintaining its power. That uh, and another plan, game plan of China that it is it backfired actually at this uh, show uh, recently is that uh, they maintain the Hong Kong autonomy, they maintain the Hong Kong institution, but replace the Hong Kong local people with mainland Chinese people in the financial sector is the most uh, obvious example. Um, and uh, so a lot of Chinese tycoons is in Hong Kong, assume Hong Kong identity, and then do business in Hong Kong. But at the same time, uh, once these Chinese officials or families of officials and, and tycoon that they it has something to do with the question about the tycoon. And it's not only Lee Kaseng. Lee Kaseng, of course, is very well known about the Chinese government is not very happy with him. Uh, and uh, but even he was kind of uh, being attacked. And who else can, can be spared from being attacked? And, um, and, but also even mainland Chinese tycoon in Hong Kong, uh, they are not particularly, or everything are in line with Beijing, that there's a lot of sign of it, that uh, uh, many, People actually, many many Chinese wealthy people in Hong Kong fear the extradition bill more than uh, the dissidents <laughs> who are going to have to travel of arresting Josiah Wong and transferring him to the And it is it is the, the Chinese type of national agenda that uh, this could cause for the killing. And that, that it is widely reported, and everybody knows it, in the Four Seasons Hotel in Hong Kong that they like to service apartment for all these kind of really kind of style of state. And then one journalist and, and is being recorded, I don't uh, we'll talk about it. One journalist tell me that actually the Chinese uh, security officers uh, the, 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 they, they also have like two rooms uh, <laughs> staying there to monitor all these other people in the same hotel. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but but it is um, so much a hassle for them to cross the border to kidnap or arrest and transfer <laughs> these people to make a friend. And so this, the, one of the images I think they want to do the extradition bill is that it make this kind of thing easier. So it's very interesting. You can check out that report 
in June, I forgot which day, uh, in Financial Times, there's a report uh, saying that actually there was a private um, dinner party between Carrie Lam, chief executive of Hong Kong, and all these uh, mainland Chinese tycoon uh, with Hong Kong residency. Uh, and in that dinner, uh, it, didn't, it didn't name who is in there. Uh, I don't know where, who they are, but they are trying to hide me in Hong Kong and Hong Kong residents have a dinner, a private dinner with Harry Lam. And in that dinner, that Chinese tycoon in Hong Kong lobbied the Harry Lam not to do the tradition bill. Um, and it's a report in, in, in the Financial Times. You can check it out in the June uh, uh, report about it. And then there's a lot of this kind of interesting sign. You pay attention to South China Point Post, now owned by Jack Ma. We look at the SDMP coverage of the protests. They are treating the protesters as heroes. And there's a feature story about that, how, how much sacrifice they make, and all this kind of stuff. You, when Jack Ma is acquiring SDMP, and people are always turning SDMP is the uh, red newspaper, and, and, and it is in some way in many reporting about June form and things like that. There's controversy about some outspoken, uh, like, uh, opinion. He's where I get fired and things like that. So, but in this tradition bill, it's very interesting to look at the SDLP coverage of it. This is very positive for the protest. Uh, so you look at this side that uh, not only the, the local Hong Kong tycoon, you can, uh, you can <coughs> guess or speculate that actually this mainland Chinese tycoon in Hong Kong is, is actually is not totally in mind uh, with, uh, uh, with in China. So it's why that they, they want to increase the grid because uh, and another example is all this kind of, uh, uh, if you know about this backstory about journalism, that different factions in the Chinese Communist Party, uh, they have uh, their contacts in different major press uh, in, in the Western media, like, like uh, this faction uh, uh, has their contact in New York Times and, and Reuters and, and, and uh, Financial Times and, and, and Global and whatsoever. So we look at uh, when there's a third about Xi Jinping's uh, overseas, uh, Xi Jinping family's overseas uh, 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 properties and, and kind of scandal, uh, or a third on Wen Jiabao, or a third on Jiang Naming and whatever, uh, there's certain press that is reporting this. So definitely, that this kind of uh, journalist is not, uh, they, are, they are very good journalists, many of them are good journalists, they are powerful journalists, uh, but I don't think that uh, uh, if there's no visible in different viral factors, uh, to feed them with this information, they won't be able to uh, get a hold of this information and make it known. And then what I uh, get is that a lot of this kind of information exchange that are happening in Hong Kong. So there's all these major um, Western media, international media, they have an office in Hong Kong and then trying to official and, 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 and keep feeding uh, information, dirt and scandal about their viral factors and things like that. So this Hong Kong is a kind of a Place that have the freedom of information and all this kind of thing, that uh, definitely that from a Beijing perspective is no good because uh, it makes the kind of uh, power struggles and whatever um, uh, that can threaten the stability of the leadership uh, can be spilled out to become international issue will get international attention right Hong Kong. So it's another impetus for China to increase the um, uh, grip on Hong Kong. Uh, but uh, again, that. Uh, Whatever game plan that they, they can develop, it always creates a kind of a backfire situation that uh, they can uh, not fully uh, establish full control uh, of things uh, uh, unless they really uh, uh, go for one country, one system and abolishing the recognition of the, the basic law and things like that. But, uh, it's going to happen in 2047, it's uh, in, in everybody's mind because, formally speaking, that this one country system has an expiration date. And, like first to not 247, what happened after that, I wouldn't know. Uh, of course, people are saying that they're trying to uh, turn it to a country system before that, but we will limit uh, when, when this uh, uh, basic law and time will be this uh, uh, joint declaration is still effective. Uh, but there's a kind of a messy situation here that uh, Hong Kong gives Beijing and Chinese economy a lot of uh, uh, convenience, uh, but at the same time, it gives them some extra habits. So we'll open it up to the floor. Yeah, I have a complex question for you. It appears to me from what you said that Hong Kong plays a very important in between role between China and the West. The question is, um, what is your view of the import of the situation in Hong Kong with respect to 
the three major things going on. One is the rapid growth of the Delta and all around the world and the financing needs of that. And the second one is the undecided trade uh, situation with the US, which is more, which is probably more than just trade. It's probably all kinds of other agreements involved in that as well. And the third is the crisis in the banking system that's now going, it's now occurring in terms of the the inner um, the interbank lending and the uh, negative interest rates and inverted yields. So you have a crisis in the, in the Western financial system. And all this is happening simultaneously. And how do you see the, the Hong Kong situation bearing on that? And where do you, do you, what do you see about all of that? Um, uh, my question is, uh, uh, what, 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 do you, what do you think about the timing of the the speed of Hong Kong speed on the London Stock Exchange? You know, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and also the uh, apparent uh, immutable uh, in the reply of the uh, London Stock Exchange about it might open the uh, opportunities to yes. uh, cooperate with Shanghai yeah. to do the bidding. Yeah. And my second question is, um, in, uh, uh, when 30, for, uh, for the 50 years unchanged, coming to uh, closer to its end, how do you look at the, uh, uh, the Hong Kong as an offshore financial yeah. center? Would it still yeah. stay like that? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a question that's complex enough, uh, and <laughs> it's very complex. And but Hong Kong environment is important in the, in the sense that it is important in the internationalization of the RMB. That is uh, when China set up the AIB and, and all these kind of financial vehicles to to do the bank role. That one major constraint of the bank role right now is that China is still using the US dollar. In all these parent projects, when they lend money to Pakistan, it's using US dollar. Uh, even when our old friend, uh, not old friend, uh, is not like personal friend, like participate in one of his uh, uh, activities that he held uh, in, in 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 the US, in this US trying to convince uh, Patrick Ho or to that uh, he was behind bar because uh, he is doing this kind of uh, alleged, not alleged, is proven his uh, guilty of it already. <laughs> that is bribery um, of African uh, leaders. And why US has all this evidence about the bribery? Because it, the, the US friends of these companies and or whatever, and they, 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 they receive the payment in US dollar. And all this US dollar need to be cleared in the banking system in New York. So the FBI and, and, and the US uh, authorities can get a whole of all these transaction records uh, so far as we're use, using US dollar. So it's why it's a it's trouble for China that when right, they do moving, expanding their investment in banks in, um, in, in to bear more countries that they have been using US dollar because, for example, even Venezuela, I talked about yesterday, that originally China wanted to lend money to Venezuela is one of the At that time, Chavez is sending all thanks. If he's one of the people, don't want to take a loan. Take a loan with US dollar. And then China is using US dollar. And, and, uh, and then it uh, make the whole benefits of the bearing more under the possibility of being the, the being um, um, including this the US uh, international sanction regime because the US has been weaponizing the US dollar uh, for a long time with this sector because if you're banned you have US dollar dealing then you have have a kind of the, um, approval from the US uh, federal uh, reserve system to access to the US dollar then if uh, this is how how the sanction on Iran work or on North Korea work is that uh, Iran is cut off from supply to US dollar and then any banks and any economic entities who do business with Iran while waiting as an exchange, the US will penalize those banks or institutions by cutting off their access to US dollar. In the US dollar standard in the global economy, meaning that you are going to be squeezed out of business. Uh, so it is US has been weaponizing this US dollar. Uh, standard uh, for political use uh, uh, until unless some other currency replaces the US dollar, then I don't see any in the in the, in the near future. And the use of US dollar in all this kind of world is very make China whole project very vulnerable, and all these business uh, entities and financial industry are involved in this very vulnerable. So China plan is to uh, to internationalize the world. So it is an ideal world if uh, very no country can take a loan in world 
uh, they can do the transaction. If, if for example, Patrick Ho do the payment to his African friends in Rwanda, uh, the clearance is going to be done in Hong Kong. There's no way that US will be able to get a hold of all this transaction record. So it is a, a lot of much more convenient for China to do all kind of things if uh, uh, it cross all kind of run beat zone in the bearing role. Uh, so in that regard, the point is important that uh, what is run beat internationalization. What I uh, uh, said is that uh, uh, of course that China can instantly intellectualize the run beat of Hong Kong if China can take the risk of cap liberalizing its capital account, opening up the financial market and making run beat uh, uh, freely convertible like all other currency, but they don't want to take the risk. Uh, of having foreign company coming into China to take control or have increasing control of China's financial system. So, so far as the Communist Party is uh, uh, not willing to let go the, the, its control of the financial system, we need to rely on Hong Kong to do the internationalization of the RMB. So, to what they are doing is that they're increasing the pool of RMB in Hong Kong and then make that Hong Kong pool of RMB freely convertible. So, it's still like regulated amount of RMB. Uh, anything wrong happened with that financial system that there's a fire for that, that is, uh, the payment price economy will not fully uh, uh, affected. So it's my uh, uh, similar and, and, and after it being done with uh, the team that Chief uh, Executive is talking about Hong Kong becoming a major center of uh, bear and roll for financing and things like that. So it is all about this uh, run of internationalization. In that regard, Hong Kong is very important in that. And, and uh, and uh, the related question about this offshore financial center um, is that actually that we look at this kind of a Chinese financial think tank as a Chinese financial think tank have been talking publishing report about RMB internationalization. The original uh, architecture is that to make Hong Kong is the wholesaler of the RMB business. We have a lot of retail centers, retail uh, centers for RMB uh, transactions. London is one of them. Singapore and, and Frankfurt and all other financial centers. Hong Kong is still the wholesale center of RMB internationalization. So it's puzzling why the Hong Kong Stock Exchange was suddenly very interested in uh, acquiring, trying to acquire uh, the, Hong, uh, the London Stock Exchange. Uh, there's a lot of speculation, of course, that uh, there's still concern to confirm that their real intention. I don't think they will talk about it uh, explicitly. Uh, but my guess is that uh, it is, and, and actually it is a very bad timing to do it. Uh, uh, because when Hong Kong is unrest is still unwinding and, and, and uh, nobody knows when how it's going to end and, and things like that. And in, in the end that the London Stock Exchange actually reject the offer like two days afterward. Uh, and then you, you can check the London Stock Exchange uh, website, they have this letter um, that they uh, draft uh, write to Lisa Jia and, and, and uh, uh, Ms. Chow, which is the, the, the head of the board of director of Hong Kong Stock Exchange, that is a very harsh terms. Uh, first, they're very unhappy that they disclosed the, 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 the attempt by unilaterally without letting the London Stock Exchange know that it's not major. The, the major thing that they reject there is that uh, uh, given the special un, the unusual relation we call it, between the board of directors of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and the Hong Kong government, uh, that uh, the, the deal is not going to be approved or there will be a lot of complication when the deal is being scrutinized by the regulated financial regulatory bodies of not only uh, UK but also US because uh, of all this kind of transnational linkage between the London Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange, any kind of this kind of acquisition need to be scrutinized by US uh, federal authorities. Uh, so that in the letter that uh, explaining why they reject the deal is that it, it is very risky. Uh, provided with your unusual relation between the board of directors, because more than half of the board of directors are appointed by the Hong Kong government. And Hong Kong government, right now, in the international community, is not is a, the best time in terms of its image. Uh, so the, the London Star Exchange rejected the deal very swiftly, and, and Lisa Chia is saying that he's going to try again, that, and, and uh, they will. But, uh, the timing and the eagerness of uh, Hong Kong Stock to, to, to acquire the Stock Exchange is very interesting. That my counterfactual um, analysis is that if it is a reality, it is really easy for Shanghai and Shenzhen to replace Hong Kong as a financial center for China. That, 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 that there's no reason that uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange will, will, will try to go and acquire the Hong Kong Stock Exchange because if you open 
uh, maybe the children in Shanghai or Shenzhen as a financial center, and company, uh, foreign company just moved to these places to do business, and, uh, and uh, uh, Chinese companies still can do can IPO and business. Because the longest stop actually look at the data. So I think the data is like the, the uh, uh, IPO, the size of IPO in London Stock Exchange much smaller than Hong Kong. The Hong Kong is a kind of major center of the uh, uh, initial public offering of many companies because of uh, the Chinese companies are doing a lot of IPOs in Hong Kong. And London is actually cannot even beat the Hong Kong Stock Exchange in terms of size. So uh, if Shenzhen and Shanghai can replace Hong Kong because most of the, the global IPO businesses uh, in recent years are uh, mostly uh, the most profitable and, and, and most thriving business are uh, Chinese companies doing IPO, then then you just move the business to Shenzhen and Shanghai and then you don't need to, to get uh, to, to London because London is a much smaller market. And of course uh, that they, they are also buying the bonds market in the, in the London financial system. But again then you won't need the London uh, uh, one if, if you can easily uh, uh, develop Shanghai and Shenzhen to replace Hong Kong, uh, and Hong Kong is now the biggest one. Uh, so it is a plan B that in case Hong Kong is destroyed in, in this political unrest recently, that I, I guess my own speculation, speculation, you never know until like 10 years later that whether it's a good intention, is that they want to try to develop a plan B to, if Hong Kong is destroyed as a financial center, so they still through Hong Kong Stock Exchange and the Hong Kong government control of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. If they manage to own the London Stock Exchange, so they they, they control, and other foreign um, uh, foreign uh, uh, offshore financial markets, so all these IPO and financial deals can move from Hong Kong to London. With the understanding that if Hong Kong is destroyed, the the underpinning uh, thing is that uh, the bottom line is that I clearly uh, very firmly believe that if Hong Kong is destroyed as a financial center, that uh, the replacement is not going to be any 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 place closer to China, but any place. Some places far away from China that can be Singapore, can be London, and I think the Chinese government know it and the Hong Kong government know it. So I think it is one. My speculation is that is one important reason that they started to be very interested in, in, in trying to uh, to do the deal with uh, the London uh, stock exchange. And of course, that uh, what happened after two thousand forty seven, nobody know. And then the, the assumption in the global financial uh, community is that. Uh, is why the effect on RMB appreciation and, and all this book about RMB becomes the next uh, uh, hegemonic currency replacing the US dollar. Because the expectation is that, and the Chinese uh, financial regulator and the Chinese government and Chinese central bank, the People's Bank of China, have been talking about is that over time, uh, China will fully open up its financial system. It's sort of a matter of time. Uh, is that, uh, it's not that we don't want to do it, we want to do it slowly. Eventually, China's financial system. Will be fully open and China uh, currency as the RMB will be fully convertible. So it's the expectation. Back in 2012, 2013, and 2014, is why IMF included RMB in this uh, currency basket of uh, special joint rights and, and it's a top five currency. Um, but after 2015, you see that actually China reversed uh, the process uh, by imposing more capital control measures. Uh, closing up the financial system further. So now nobody believes that uh, it is the eventual end game or the intention of China to fully open up this financial system. Um, but it can still change costs, maybe CDP changes mind or um, other uh, policymakers uh, gain more control and eventually maybe uh, 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years down the line, China financial system is fully open. Uh, China's currency become fully convertible. At that point, that really is a possibility that uh, Hong Kong has no use to try. Uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen can um, uh, fully replace Hong Kong. But it's a big if uh, uh, from the current situation that we can tell that uh, Chinese uh, government is not very interested in even more important than the open up its financial center and make one be fully convertible. Uh, I think because of this capital flights uh, concern that if they open up, uh, this financial system and it uh, open up its uh, uh, and make the RMB fully convertible. Then, then the big risk is that all these wealthy people uh, from China will will, will 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 try to leave and convert the currency to other currencies, my properties, other belonging in other currency. Uh, it has something to do with this Chinese characteristics, um, <coughs> socialist market economy. And this is very commonly right. Uh, China's price is not uh, is not guaranteed, is not protected. 
and uh, the, the government still have control of the economy and ownership of everything, that they still have an incentive for many people to move their lives. So this is kind of like worry that uh, is uh, uh, returning the Chinese government to, to, to move forward in liberalizing the financial system. So without that, then, then Hong Kong is still very replaceable. If it isn't replaced, it, it will be replaced by by places of financial centers out of the charge of places close to the charge. Final questions? Um, I have a question regarding the global slideshow. This is before the USA and China uh, policy. Before that, it's a slideshow of a graph. If you move the mic, you go back to the graph. That Wait, which graph again? Uh, before the US and the, uh, China uh, policy in 1992. There's a graph before that. We talk about the start, start the exchange outflow and inflow from, yeah, from like that, yeah, from uh, Hong Kong. Either one of those two. Graph or table? Graph? This is not one of the table, table, sorry. Table? Yeah, table. Yeah. This one? No. Uh, this no. one? Yeah. yeah, that one. I don't understand what that uh, table is about. Can you uh, elaborate this table? Uh, we take more technical. Are there any other questions? I actually had a question. Yeah. Um, so, a lot of the discussion about what's going to happen in Hong Kong now has focused on what will they do in Hong Kong. Um, the narrative that you've provided seems that, you know, Hong Kong's special status is actually not, a, we have to consider it not only in terms of what will Beijing do, but what will the rest of the world do, yeah. and then Beijing's response to it. Um, so the question is, how much of it is really Beijing, or how much is it is actually you know, the rest of the world, say, how the US treats Hong Kong? And where is Hong Kong's autonomy in all of this? Does Hong Kong actually have any sense of autonomy? Then, yes, uh, the, the, the cool question, what is this table is about this, um, in the Chinese official government official statement about this um, uh, over direct investment that's money going out from China, coming out of China and, and in other places in the world, and of course, then, then the, the thing is that uh, uh, Hong Kong is under Chinese sovereignty, but they always count Hong Kong as an overseas entity. So uh, money going out from China and I mean, Hong Kong is counted as uh, China outgoing foreign direct investment into Hong Kong from, from mainland China. So, so, the, the, so the, the first one is stock, that is the, 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 the accumulated total amount um, of um, money um, that has flowed out of China and Hong Kong over the years. It just add up the, the flow of annual um, the outflow. Uh, and so it's the stock, and then it's the flow, and then it just shows that actually Hong Kong is the major destination of uh, whatever money coming out of China to the rest of the world. And, and what I'm saying is that. Uh, uh, this money not necessarily stay in China, Hong Kong forever, but many of them actually stay in Hong Kong and then become a Hong Kong company or identify, uh, the, assume a Hong Kong identity and then go way all the way to other places. Just like the money going to Virgin Islands and the Cayman Islands, uh, that nobody believes that all the money are staying in there forever and, and investing in the beach and <laughs> stuff there. Yeah, so it's just, it's just invest in there and then create a company there and then, and then use that. The uh, company should invest in everywhere else, somewhere else in, in, in the world. So it's kind of a key transit. Uh, it's, it's quite sure that Hong Kong is a key transit um, or gateway of Chinese capital going out of the world. And regarding the uh, real question is that yes, that uh, it is dynamic and dialectical, if you will, that uh, uh, what happened to Hong Kong is not totally dependent on what China do in Hong Kong, but also how the international community react to Hong Kong. and. It has something to do with how the international community, particularly US, relations with China. So it's not why people are saying that now, right now is a perfect storm. That if, for example, that uh, many uh, 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 journalists in Hong Kong actually talk journalists in mainland China too, and asking me where the US is behind all these protests, then uh, <laughs> I'm telling them that the US has much less influence on what is going on in the streets in Hong Kong than many people think, but because if U.S. had total control on, on the protesters and total control on and, and what is happening in the street, that the umbrella movement would not have happened. 
because in 2014, at that time, U.S. China relations is still quite good, and there's a lot of people within the establishment in the Obama administration. Actually, um, you can tell on the sign of, of the public, uh, um, the public uh, statement, and, uh, and and afterward, and probably talk to some of these uh, think tank and former officials and things like that. You have a sense that actually the U.S. at that time preferred the Democrats in Hong Kong to take the the the, the offer. Uh, from the Chinese government, actually, or from, from the Hong Kong government, to what uh, you see that basically that's a, to take the political reform that uh, Hong Kong offer that there's still room for you to further open it up. Uh, so take it, take the offer. Uh, have a universal suffrage under China under Beijing term first. So my understanding or my feeling is that at that time that uh, U.S. is is actually has a, it is a lot of official position and there's a lot of people in the State Department at that time and in the Feng Tang Circle in DC uh, has this strong passion about it. don't fight it, just, just take the deal. Um, and, 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 and many people are openly talking about it still, that for example, Richard Bush and Booking Institution, that he's still writing about it, and at that time, the Democrat the Democrat should have accepted that deal. Uh, so at that time, you look at this, some, if, if, if and many people allege it, uh, that, uh, for example, like the Daily is under US influence and they are kind of vehicle to influence. Uh, uh, protester and things like that. If it is the case, I'm not saying it is the case. If it is the case, then you can see the reporting and, and about uh, this so-called uh, pockets of the U.S. and, and they, they they are trying to get people out of the streets from the not make the occupation last that long. That uh, the mainstream Democrat and the Echo Daily and things like that at that time in 2014 they are if it is the the the, the policy of the U.S. and big if. Uh, then, then, then they are trying to, to end the occupation and don't let it drag on uh, for a long time. I really believe that at that time it is the U.S. government efforts that that, that, that thing don't blow up too much and, and just just go on. Uh, you don't want to see any ongoing conflict uh, that will have a bad uh, effect on the U.S. China relation and things like that. And at that time, it's still U.S. China relation is still very good. And if U.S. really have control of things on Hong Kong, then the umbrella will not have last seventy nine days. Uh, the fact that it did last seventy nine days, then it's so that actually U.S. doesn't have control of this kind of streets. Uh, so, so definitely, it is not uh, U.S. behind it and. Um, and but of course, the U.S. reaction to all this uh, is, is very important in uh, shaping uh, China uh, action on it. And, and so, because after the umbrella that the, 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 and then China and, and, and that the U.S. before until Donald Trump and until the recent uh, issues that the uh, U.S. is still cooperating with China in all kind of issues over North Korea and many other things. So it is all kind of a regime of doing things, and, and China gets very courageous in doing. All kind of uh, crackdown, like arresting uh, and putting um, uh, uh, this kind of leaders of umbrella to jail, uh, and also disqualifying um, uh, all these uh, elected uh, uh, legislative councillors and things like that. So they're going aggressive, and uh, because at that time <coughs> Beijing is still under the assumption that the U.S. was stick with the Kissinger, this is the old kind of U.S. China policy <coughs> since Kissinger. Uh, uh, that is uh, to to, uh, to make a lot of concessions uh, with China on all kind of marginal issues like Hong Kong is one of it and Taiwan is another. Uh, so that uh, China will help US on the big things like North Korea and, and all kind of other issues. Uh, so it's the old regime, and then Beijing's assumption is always that the US is sticking with this old regime, uh, and then so far as it is the case, then Beijing is. Uh, uh, kind of a luxury to become more and more aggressive. Now that the U.S. totally uh, approach to China policy has changed, it's not only about Donald Trump, it's about the whole political economy and, and, and best infrastructures of the U.S. China policy um, uh, um, circle uh, has changed. So the, that uh, Beijing has not adjusted that yet. So uh, this is why now it's caught in a kind of a not knowing what to do and there's a few good options in terms of its uh, dealing with um, uh, you can see the chaos in, in, in the policy signal that is sent out. Sometimes it uh, gets some PLA, uh, police, military police uh, to do exercise in Shenzhen to, to, to threaten Hong Kong. At the same time, uh, you see some uh, uh, Global Times editorial saying that, oh, that we have, to have a more softer tone. So you see this kind of back and forth. You know that Beijing is now in a situation that, that actually didn't quite know what to do because it is still. 
uh, I just entered this new world of US trend policy. So it's all kind of a pieces of uh, uh, puzzle that is uh, interrelated, and and, uh, and and Hong Kong is definitely uh, not totally autonomous in the sense that it can do whatever it want to get whatever it want and. Even as an individual, so it's an age-old discussion about agency and structures as individuals, human beings and social structures, and whether you are a puppet of this larger force or you have more altruistic uh, 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 kind of uh, power to do whatever you like to shape the structures. Uh, uh, it's like that, that uh, you, you make history, but under the constraint given by all these kind of uh, precedents and and structural constraints. So I think that uh, the Hong Kong uh, oppositions and, and students and things like that, they are becoming more and more autonomous in the sense that, that uh, there are still this structural constraint. Uh, but you have freedom, uh, you have extra freedom when you are more aware, uh, cognizant of these constraints and try to make advantage of uh, the contradictions among these structural forces. And then you can uh, uh, go back to learning. So, right? Uh, that that uh, you you have the power to make history against all of us after you know all these structural forces, how it works and what is the contradiction among these structural forces, and export this contradiction among these structural forces, and then you you can do things against all of us. I think that Hong Kong is becoming more and more autonomous and getting more and more freedom in this sense. Well, on that note, thank you again for sharing your thoughts.